quick uh, welcome message on behalf of the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs and our, our partner in whew, many of these conversations today, the Foundation of Government Accountability out in Florida, and Taryn Bragg and my colleague, uh, the CEO of FGA is here as well. Uh, this is an important dialogue for our state, um, but for the citizens of the state as well. How do we make sure that we provide quality care and provide opportunity for every citizen while also making sure that we're keeping taxpayers in mind and the citizens that are trying to make sure that the state and the economy grows and that live within the economy. It's an important dialogue and the fact that you all are here today when you don't have to be is very encouraging for many of us. So we thank you for your time uh, and we thank you for participating in this all important discussion for our state. And with that in mind, two of the leaders that have helped move this discussion forward and make sure that we're still having this dialogue today uh, Representative Glenn Mulready from the House and uh, Kim David, Senator Kim David uh, in the Senate, who I'm going to now turn the floor over to. And let me just say thank you both for your leadership. Thank you for bringing us here today. And thank you for all you're doing for the state. Senator David, the floor is yours. Make sure I'm in the right place. I want to thank everybody for being here this morning. This, this is an astounding turnout. Um, I had no idea that when I asked, um, I asked uh, Michael and Jonathan to help put this on and, and Representative Mulready that we would get this type of response. So this, this is, goes to show everyone that this is a top concern in our state. Um, real quickly, I wanna, I wanna thank a couple of people that I see here in the room. Um, I see Secretary Chris Binge back there in the back. Um, <laughs> I've got I've got Katie here with the governor's office. Katie, thank you so much for coming. Um, I've got Keith Beal here with the lieutenant governor's office. A couple of my um, state senators, I have Senator Loveless and Senator Boggs that are here currently, and I, hopefully we'll have more shift in and out. I'm gonna let uh, Representative Mulready introduce his members, but we have a lot of you guys here, and, I, and the fact that you're not in today and you actually got up to come to this, um, thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. Real quickly, I just, wanted to, I just wanted to say what led us here, what led me here. You know, four years ago, when I first ran for office, the number one topic at the doorstep was government in our health care. Heard it time and time again that Oklahomans wanted to be free to make their own choice in their health care. So with that, when it, whenever I got into office, I started looking at what Oklahoma, what our state actually does to facilitate health care for the poor of our state and the most vulnerable population of our state. And when I saw that we had some of the, whor the poorest health outcomes in the nation, yet we paid some of the highest Medicaid provider rates in the nation, uh, you know, I, I had to start asking the questions. Well, you know, who is it that we serve? What drives them? And the same thing with the providers. What drives them? What is it that we're missing in that key component of serving that population, the poor and the most vulnerable? And we as taxpayers, you know, we, and we as legislators have the responsibility of ensuring that, that our tax dollars are spent wisely and that we get the best health care for this population that we can, keeping in mind that they are still Oklahomans that are proud and want choice in their health care. So with that, I started looking at what other states were doing. Um, three years ago, I became the chair of the sub Probes for Health and Human Services, so I had the budget. When I started looking at the budget and the out-of-control cost of Medicaid, that piggybacking, um, coming right along the heels is the Affordable Health Care Act and all the problems and the financial difficulties we were seeing with that in our state. It became obvious that we we could not just sit back and do nothing, that we had to find the best solution. And I'm, I'm just proud of the fact that there are so many people here today that are interested in this. We've got people here from other states. We've got policymakers that have come in today that have taken a lot of time out of their, their schedule to come in to tell us how they've been able to do it in their states. And hopefully this opens that dialogue with everyone here in the state so we can start, we can start finding an Oklahoma solution to this. Um, and with that, I, I'm going to turn this over to Representative um, Glenn Mulready and let him introduce his members. Thank you.
Thank you, Senator David. Um, good morning, everyone. Good to see everyone out here. I will uh, start by saying I'm most proud of all the House members that are here, my colleagues. Uh, those of you that don't know, the House is not in session today. And uh, I'll speak for myself. When session ends here on uh, at the end of the week, you just don't want to get between me and my door with my family. And uh, uh, so, and the Highway Patrol does sometimes. But. Uh, <laughs> So for them to stick around uh, to be part of this, I uh, uh, very, very much appreciate it. But uh, Representative Quinn, uh, soon to be Senator Quinn, Representative Casey, uh, Representative Randy Graw, Tom Newell, uh, Elise Hall, um, Floor Leader Pam Peterson. I saw Tommy Harden come in, Representative Harden, and uh, Representative Weldon Watson. And I might note, I saw Senator Dom walk in just a little bit ago too, who wasn't recognized earlier. So thank, thank you all for, for being here. If a fight breaks out, the House outnumbers the Senate here. We're good. <laughs> so uh, with those introductions, just a few comments. You know, to me, this, this issue is, is about sustainability, and that's what we are trying to move uh, towards a more sustainable model. Uh, we want to maximize taxpayer dollars. That's a key issue for us. You know, just last year alone, uh, and again, honing in on some specifics, you know, we had a $10 million increase in ER visits alone in our, our Sooner Care program between 2012 and 2013. We're now basically serving a million people, uh, you know, close to 30% of our population are fall under the program. 63% of all births in Oklahoma through our Sooner Care program. 72% of all children under the age of five are on Sooner Care at some point. We're spending a billion state dollars, about close to four and a half billion total dollars in that program. And all that to say, it's a, it's a growing demand of taxpayer dollars that we want to try to get a hold of. And, and again, just make sure we're maxim maximizing our benefits, maximizing our outcomes there. Today's goal, as I see it, is, is um, really to highlight some of the successes that have been seen in other states. We've had folks travel from, you see on your agenda, uh, numerous different states to talk about their experiences there. There'll be some opportunity for some Q&A with a panel of um, insurance plans that operate in some other states. Uh, and, and hopefully, um, I know the Hospital Association asked me a week or two ago, and you know, what I'd like to see is uh, some of the fears drawn down of what we're trying to accomplish here. And uh, so that's the main goal, but mainly to educate our members, my colleagues, uh, providers, and other stakeholders uh, in this issue. And I'll just end with uh, an image that I, that I got, and pardon me, I've got three little boys, I, I tend to try to talk in pictures, but you know, I, I'm a strong believer in a safety net program, and that's what we have here, is a, is a safety net program. I'm concerned if we're not careful, that safety net program really becomes a, a trap, a net trap around all other uh, agencies and uh, you know, viable needs and um, for those government dollars, and I don't want to trap in because of the demands uh, through this program, that growing need, that we then trap every other, you know, education and, and transportation infrastructure and those sort of things. So that's why we want to um, move to maximize those dollars. So again, thank you all for being here. And who am I introducing first? Is he here? Okay. Go ahead. Again, thank you for your uh, attendance. Uh, it is with uh, great pleasure that I get to introduce our first guest uh, speaker, Dean Cannon from Florida. Um, his story is great about how their state arrived at uh, reaching the issue of Medicaid reform. Um, kind of the format that we want to use today is to allow the presenters to uh, give their presentation, and then after that, uh, try to allow for questions for each part of the program. Uh, I think probably the easiest way to do that is to, uh, if you've got a question, to raise your hand um, once the speaker's finished, and then I'll try to uh, recognize you and we'll start there. So with uh, that, uh, Speaker Cannon. So I am not Speaker Cannon, this is uh, Speaker Dean Cannon. I'm Taryn Bragdon, I run the Foundation for Government Accountability and we focus on working 
with elected officials on fixing their broken health care and welfare programs. We're a conservative think tank that operates at the state level in about 20 states, uh, although we're based in Naples, Florida. It's my pleasure to kick off this conversation. And we thought rather than just having Speaker Cannon talk to you uh, about what he accomplished uh, in Florida, that we would break it up by having a bit of a conversation and then opening up the conversation with all of you. Uh, I'd like to start out just so you have a sense, uh, Mr. Speaker, about who's in the room. If we could have every elected official who's here, every legislator stand up so we have a sense of your audience. Uh, yeah. No, 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 not at all. All right, so we have a lot of elected officials in the room and also a lot of uh, stakeholders and provider groups. Let I, me. I was going to say, can I do this? Who's here uh, from the various food groups? Who's here from the hospitals? Stand up. Okay, and then how about the docs? Okay, how about health plans? Uh, okay, so we got the food groups in the room. All right, that works. That works. Well, let me, before we kick off our conversation, let me tell them a little bit about your background. Uh, Dean is a fifth generation Floridian and a lawyer. Uh, and your really journey to the legislature began when you first graduated from law school back in 1995. You represented a variety of municipal uh, and business clients. And then in 2004, ran for and won election in the Florida House of Representatives, and in 2010 were selected by your peers to be Speaker of the House in Florida. And what you accomplished when you were Speaker uh, is really impressive, and the list here I think highlights a lot of challenges that policymakers have in several states and certainly here in Oklahoma. Uh, pivotal roles you played in property tax reform, growth management reform, health care and Medicaid reform, which obviously we're talking about today, and then major transportation infrastructure uh, initiatives. You now live in Tallahassee with your wife, Ellen, and your three kids. And, and I want to thank you all for being here. I, I had a chance to meet uh, Senator David and Representative Mulready last night. Uh, I've been out of office now uh, a year and a half, and I served during the four roughest times in the Florida economy politically uh, and economically since probably the Great Depression and including having uh, my predecessor speaker have to resign amidst an ethical scandal, a uh, party chairman that ultimately was convicted of embezzling from the party, uh, and dealing with Charlie Crist. And so the three things put together, who was a governor who was then a Republican, who's now a Democrat, who's now running to reclaim his old seat after being defeated by Marco Rubio in a U.S. senatorial race. So I'm done with public office. Uh, but I can tell you the biggest and best policy reform I did while I was there was Medicaid reform. And when Taryn asked me if I would come out and told me that Oklahoma was considering it, uh, I jumped at the chance. And, and I'm now, I've gone back to private practice as a lawyer uh, and a lobbyist, and I'm enjoying it uh, uh, very, very much. But if there's one thing I can tell you about the privilege to be here today is it is very possible because Florida is probably the most uh, politically weird state you're going to get. If we could reform Medicaid in Florida, you can definitely do it in Oklahoma. So I'm, I'm grateful for the chance to be here. So let's set the stage. When you pounded the gavel as speaker for the 2011 session, what was the Medicaid challenge that you and the legislature <coughs> faced? Well, we, we had faced, um, I knew it was coming from the years before I was speaker. I was actually designated two years before I became speaker. And we had a situation probably analogous to what you're facing now, which was declining state revenues, uh, an increasing Medicaid population, and we had tried the, the, the rate cutting approach, let's just cut the rates and squeeze them down artificially to try and save money, while at the same time, water is pouring over the sides of the boat uh, in the form of new enrollees. From 2001 to 2011, uh, our Medicaid population went from just under two million people to uh, almost three million people, and our Medicaid spending had gone from 13 billion in 2001 uh, to over 20 billion in 2011. And so literally, when you ran the graphs out, it was going to eat the entire discretionary spending of the legislature over the next three to five years, depending on what happened. And at that time, uh, we didn't know whether or not we were going to be facing the additional enrollment coming from uh, the Affordable Care Act. But we knew that if that happened, it, it truly would have uh, bankrupted the state. Uh, we, didn't, we had a pay and chase system where detecting fraud was next to impossible. And we had, I think, over 100,000 fee-for-service providers 
in a state with around 18 million people, which was just, it was just a mess. We didn't even know who was getting care. And so we knew uh, that we could either try to put it off. I thought about kicking it off to my predecessor, uh, Will Weatherford, who's now the speaker, who, who was very glad we did this then, uh, and decided, no, we're going to try and tackle it, and, and it would be politically challenging. It would make a lot of people upset, a lot of my friends upset. Uh, but that was, that was what it looked like on the front end. So it sounds like you walk into this policy and fiscal mess. And as you talked about, even thinking that under the Affordable Care Act at the time, before the Supreme Court decision, that you would be forced to take on millions of more adults in the Medicaid program. But when you stepped back, Medicaid is supposed to be this safety net healthcare program. So how was it doing actually helping the patients who were on the program get healthier? That, and that was actually the, one of the first questions I asked. My brother actually is a physician who, who did one of his fellowships actually here in Oklahoma City about eight years ago. And the problem was we didn't know what kind of health outcomes we were getting. Uh, one of the, the shocking things about providing health care, our, our state-funded health care to you know, almost 3 million people and spending $20 billion was we had no real practical uh, measurement of what kind of health, health outcomes we were getting. In many cases, we found out from the fraud unit that care wasn't being rendered at all. It was just, you know, people were just filing these claims and, and figuring that by the time it took the government to find out, they wouldn't find it. Um, but, but truthfully, we didn't know if people with systemic diseases like diabetes and, and hypertension were getting treatment. There was no monitoring of it, and, and it was just, it was a disaster. And, and it's, it was, a, at that time, a truly dysfunctional entitlement program that was growing more dysfunctional as you added more people to the system. So as a Republican, you're faced with this entitlement program, and ideally you want somebody to be on a safety net program for as short a time as possible and to get off that safety net program out of poverty and onto a better life. And what you're saying is you had no idea whether Medicaid was doing that or just sustaining them in their bad health. Well, we, we knew that, we, that people were using the emergency room for primary care. We knew that um, the population was growing and we had no way to, to accurately measure, cost account for, or, or manage uh, whether they were getting care and making sure that they got the care they needed as if you come at it from the sort of compassionate side of, hey, these are poor people who are ill. They, have, they need medical care, and, and we in the state have decided we're gonna do something about it. You're, you're failing on that end if you're not making sure they're getting the care they deserve and, and that they need. Uh, and you're also failing on the fiscal end because the costs are spiraling upward while at the same time you don't even know if they're getting the care they, they needed. So with that challenge, what would you say to policymakers in the room about Medicaid reform being worth the political lift? Uh, well, it's worth it from, from really three, three vantage points. The first one is the basic, if you, if you care about the people who elected you, and I'm sure you all have people who are on Medicaid in your districts, or most of you do, uh, you have a basic duty to make sure that they're, you know, from a humanitarian standpoint, getting care. Even if you don't care about the humanitarian standpoint, the, the fiscal responsibility, if you're going to spend however many, many hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, you've got an obligation to make sure you do it right and make sure that you're getting something for the money you're spending. Uh, I remember when we used to have hearings, uh, before I did the reform, I would, I would call uh, with my, my chief ally, uh, who became my appropriations chairman, uh, Representative Denise Grimsley, uh, who was a nurse, who would be able to look them in the eye and say, this is going to hurt, uh, which she did frequently. We called into the room, we had a room about this size, and it had about four times as many people, it was packed. And it was the HMOs and the docs and the hospitals and the for-profit hospitals and the not-for-profit hospitals and the specialty care providers and the patient advocates and all their lobbyists. And the combined money being spent on the lobbyists in the room alone was enough to provide health care to a good number of people in Florida. And they would all testify. This, was, this is the testimony they would give. They would all come up to the dais and we'd say, tell us, Mr. Uh, advocate or Mr. You know, person with the medical association, what do you think? The system appears broken. And the testimony could all be phrased like this. Uh, yes, Chairman, you absolutely must reform Medicaid. It's a broken system. We agree with you. We, we, we heard the staff's presentation. Um, so you should absolutely radically reform it and make it better, but don't move my cheese. Leave my little carve out intact. If I'm in the hospitals, just protect us. Screw everybody else. We don't care if they get taken care of. Just protect my little carve out. And, and this theme just repeated over weeks and weeks and weeks of hearings. And, and because that's the natural goal, if you, if you live in a system, even if it's broken, your tendency is to say, okay, fix everybody else, but leave my fiefdom or my turf alone. You can't reform Medicaid that way. And what we did, one of the things we told them was, we will be equally fair to everyone so that no one will be the winner, uh, hopefully except the patients. No one, no one will be, get everything they want. 
everyone will have to give a little bit, but in the end, everyone actually agreed to it and worked with it. And now, even though the Democrats voted against it when we passed it, uh, uh, they now claim it was a big, broad, bipartisan support because it's actually worked. For the first time in Florida since 1967, our Medicaid, cost, our Medicaid costs this year are down over the prior year. Okay, that hasn't happened in 40 years, and it's because we had the political will to do it. So, so it is worth the political lift. It is worth the uh, inconvenience and the upset that that may visit on, I'm sure, many of your friends and as it did on mine. But in the end, like I said, we now have better measurements, better care, and we're spending less money on it. And like I said, it, it, it was, it, it's absolutely worth that, that political effort. So when you, when you started this process, you outlined clear objectives that, that with Medicaid reform, this is what we wanted to accomplish. What were those objectives? Um, we, had, we had more or less five basics, but they all centered around the common theme of better care, more accountability, and managed competition. We, had, uh, we wanted to increase the number of plans that a Medicaid enrollee could get access to. So they weren't just um, thrown in with one provider and told you can't ever leave, and, and so that that provider or that, that uh, health plan wouldn't have an incentive to keep them by giving them better care because that, that patient could leave them. Uh, the second one was to expand the number of actual medical services a Medicaid enrollee could get. Uh, the third one was to improve the overall health outcomes to make sure they actually got better health results in the end. Uh, the fourth was to, to where possible, as they could, hopefully get out of that safety net, uh, opt out of it, and get into private coverage if they wanted to, and then to increase their patient satisfaction. And, and if we did that, we knew that we'd end up saving money in the process, which is how it actually ultimately played out. And you talked about what exactly are those savings? You talked about the biggest benchmark, uh, which I think is frankly sort of unbelievable to a lot of people, is that Medicaid spending actually dropped for the first time in 40 years. But what is the reform projected to save? Um, it, I'm always leery of government project projections of, of savings. I'll just say this, probably 5% year over year, which is, that doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're spending $20 billion a year, that's a big, that's a big savings. Um, by creating a, a, a system where you don't have too few a number of plans, but you have a managed number of competing plans uh, with the buy-in from the hospitals and you guarantee their rates so that they're not going to get, they know they're not going to get a rate cut, everybody tends to work together to try and give the better outcomes for the least amount of money. And um, it, it actually produced, I think, in the end, a system where uh, over time it will, it will yield massive savings and hopefully even with the full implementation of, of uh, the Affordable Care Act, not, hopefully, not uh, disrupt the economics of the state. So I think a lot of people who are listening and certainly here in Oklahoma considering uh, their own version of Medicaid reforms are mindful of disaster ex experiences with managed care from the 80s and 90s. So tell me how what Florida did is <coughs> different than the managed care of you know, our fathers and grandfathers. Yeah, and this is, this is a valuable uh, lesson. The, the 80s and 90s reform was privatize it. You just take this whole big bleeping mess and export it to one individual uh, private company and make them manage it. And the, the flaw in that theory is if I, if I know I have a state monopoly and I have a huge massive population, there's no economic incentive for me not to squeeze the cost, you know, do the kinds of things that, that, that come when one has a monopoly and no sense of competition. And so, uh, and that, that didn't work. Ultimately, you, there, there, are, there are themes in there that are workable. But just exporting the state's problem to a single company or one or two companies, uh, we didn't think would work, and that's why we didn't do it. We actually divided the state into regions and, and, and instead uh, allowed anybody who, could, who wanted to bid, including if doctors and hospitals wanted to create a provider service network to compete with health plans, which, in fact, uh, we guaranteed them a slot if they, would, if they would apply within these regions so that they had an ample opportunity to compete on their own. Um, uh, then everyone would have an incentive to perform, but they would have a competitive reason not to fail because they knew they could lose those populations, they could lose those enrollees, and every five years they could have their contract canceled by the state uh, for non-renewal, or they could also turn, we could also, the state could terminate it uh, at any time if they weren't meeting the uh, performance, economic, or patient care standards that the state set. So it was a, a mini competitive regional system versus just giving it to one or two uh, companies and expecting them to manage it on their own. 
so I, I think just from the patient perspective, it's important to, uh, to fully appreciate what you're talking about. So under old Medicaid, you have this fee-for-service system where it's one government-run program. And then under kind of old-style managed care, you move from that monopoly to kind of this duopoly where you might have two private companies, but it looks really similar to that government-run system. In Florida's Medicaid reform, what you're saying is it actually went from this government-run old Medicaid style to the patient had four, five, six, seven different private plans. Some of them are managed care plans. Some of them are provider-led plans. And then even some are specialty plans only available to certain populations or people with certain diseases. So it went from this kind of one size fits none to it's about the patient and recognizing different things work for different people. Yeah, absolutely. And, and people told us that you couldn't do that because patients, you know, Medicaid recipients, they're not sophisticated enough to choose their own plan or choose from among plans. And, and I said, listen, they're capable of choosing among cell phone plans that are at least as complicated as the benefits package that your HMO has been providing. Uh, they can choose a health plan. They'll, they'll pick. And if they don't like yours, they'll leave. If you're not taking good care of them, you'll lose. And, and that's how we set it up. And it's actually playing out that way where, uh, depending on the size of the region, in fact, in our most populous regions down in South Florida, we had, I think, up to 11 providers. I'm not sure what the, I think it was 11 was the maximum number of providers in a given region. We also, by the way, forced people uh, who wanted to bid to become one of the, the providers. Uh, they had to agree to serve both the sort of lucrative, dense urban core areas, but they also had to agree, we set the boundaries the state set the boundaries, they had to also be able to serve the less profitable but equally important, more rural or more physically remote areas, which made sure nobody got shortchanged. And, and in Florida, especially in some of the panhandle areas, it's uneconomic to serve those populations, but if you, if you team them up uh, with, with the more profitable regions, everybody has an incentive to perform and no one gets left out. Okay, so just to understand that, because certainly Oklahoma has the same rural dynamics that parts of Florida have. So you were saying that a private plan, if they bid and won a contract in a rural area, they would automatically be guaranteed a slot in an urban area, but they couldn't pull out of one without losing the other? Actually, it was even simpler than that. We took the state map, and, and we chose, we drew the boundaries and said, and here's region one. It's got, you know, we'll start in the pan. It's got Pensacola, you know, fairly dense population, uh, works well. But you're also going to have to serve not only Escambia County, but Santa Rosa, Ogaloosa, and Walton counties you know, way out in sort of the, the, the rural area. And so anybody who wanted to bid on Region 1 knew they were going to make, probably make more money in, in Pensacola. They were probably going to lose some money in the other region. But everybody was bidding on the same population. You couldn't, they couldn't go and kind of carve their system out. And this is actually a copy of what the map looks like. But we, we, we combined, you know, from the Panhandle down to the Keys, uh, we defined mixes or regions that had uh, a, a decent balance between urban and rural and dense population versus more sparsely populated. And what that produced was an economic incentive and a common bid point for anybody who wanted to provide service to make sure that they knew what they were bidding on and they knew that within that region they were going to compete with three or four other plans at a minimum to make sure that they did a good job. And it, and it, it aligned the economic interests with the patient interests. We're going to talk more about the provider-led plans in just a minute and I'm going to bring in Josh Archambault who is one of our senior fellows uh, with expertise in this area. Um, the person who was going to be next on the panel from First Coast Advantage, which is a hospital-led plan in Florida, had an emergency conflict and can't now participate um, by Skype. But So we're going to delve into this a little bit more because I think this is a unique aspect of the system that really gives providers a new opportunity and new incentives. So I want to save some of that conversation for more in depth in just a few minutes. But from a policymaker standpoint, you've gone through this process, you've actually seen it implemented, it's saving money. Uh, Medicaid spending is dropping for the first time in 40 years. If you're talking directly to your peers in the room, what are the do's and don'ts? What advice do you have for Senator David, for Representative Mulready, and for everybody else who's having this conversation about what is a very challenging political lift? Um, in no particular order, I will throw these out, and then if there's questions uh, we can do at the appropriate time, I'd love to answer them. One, have a provider rate floor. Uh, give, give the assurance to the providers that are rendering the care that they will ultimately get paid because that is a, you know, you're asking these people to provide frontline care. Have some guarantee rate of reimbursement so that they are getting paid. Um, 
do allow providers to compete with plans. We did what we call the PSN, or Provider Service Network, and we structured our plans so that uh, it wasn't just a, uh, a game for the managed care plans to come in and bid on. Literally, doctors and hospitals could, could create their own, and, and in fact, we gave them sort of a, a reserve spot in some of the regions if they chose to. Uh, so that it's not, it, literally, it puts competitive forces on everybody, on the plans, on the doctors, on the hospitals. Um, have some form of capitated rates that protect the taxpayer and guarantee savings. We wrote a guaranteed 2.5% savings the first year with another 2.5% the second year for long-term 5% savings into the statute. Um, uh, this is a big one. Uh, throw everybody into the mix. Don't carve out populations. Uh, uh, and what I mean by that is, include all the populations and benefits in reform, because in Florida, uh, I will tell you, before we reformed it, Medicaid had been uh, sort of patchwork quilted up, where so-and-so who had a really good lobbyist from Tampa Bay got a carve out for Tampa Bay, and so-and-so who provided this type of niche medical care carved him or herself out. Dental care for kids, that got carved out. In fact, we just defeated a bill of one of my clients who tried to carve that back out this year. Put everybody in the boat, um, you know, uh, pediatric care, dental care, elderly care, um, nursing home, assisted living, wrap everybody into the system because if it's not comprehensive, you're going to get, you know, it'll be death by a thousand cuts uh, moving forward. And uh, if there is a unique population, if there's a true, uh, the exception to that rule is if there's a unique population, do create a specialty plan for that. There are some disease models that need concierge level care almost just to manage them uh, profoundly uh, uh, disabled infants and children, you, it's, you really can't capitate those costs. If, if, it's, if it's a true statistical outlier, maybe you can treat that population separately, but when in doubt, include them all in, in the system. Uh, those, are the do, those are the do's. I think in terms of the don'ts, uh, don't wait. Uh, there, there will always be a suggestion that you should put this off one year, you should do a pilot, you should just do a small pilot here, you should do a study, you should delay this thing. Look, Florida's your pilot, okay? We did it, and it worked. So, in Florida, like I said, in Florida is about as politically messy as you're going to find as far as states go. Um, so don't wait, and don't limit the, don't limit the competition to just a couple of HMOs. Let doctors, hospitals, anybody who wants to put together a plan, make sure. I think we had the minimum number of uh, people who could provide within the region. I think was four or five, and that was in our most uh, sparsely populated areas. You, one is too few. You know, one or two or three is is too monopolistic but also don't have too many. 15, 20, 30 is unmanageable. You know, we happen to chose the highest, the, the, the max, the most densely populated region had 11 providers. I think the, the least populated region, we chose to have up to four or five. But, but, but have enough plans or providers in a region to compete, but not so many that it gets unwieldy. Um, when you do your procurement, underwrite the heck out of them on the front end. Make sure you scrutinize them very heavily to make sure that they're not uh, uh, unqualified, uh, make them do whatever sort of performance guarantees, and don't be afraid to tell people no. And, I, and I'm, I was just getting briefed last night on how your, your agency works, which is a little different than Florida, but when you go to select those providers, uh, underwrite them very stringently on the front end, put strict contractual penalties for failure to perform in them so that you can fire them if they, if they fail to do a good job, and then make them compete with one another. And then uh, I, I would say this, d don't ignore the voices of those who don't like this, okay? Because they're they're being asked to change, and if and if you and if you provide healthcare in a government arena, this stuff makes you nervous, and that's appropriate. It's understandable, uh, but also don't shrink from your principles because because part of I viewed part of my job when I was in the House in Florida and as Speaker to to make the right decision whether people liked it or not, and and it worked out that way. Uh, and in this case, like I said, the, these these programmatic things, it will work. Although it will it will you will hear from your opposition. Don't ignore them, but don't let them make you um, chicken out.